So a very, very warm welcome, colleagues. It's a real pleasure to welcome you today. I'm Professor Maggie Ray, President of the Faculty of Public Health. As I say, this is one of the fantastic events and a real privilege as President of the Faculty to welcome you to our Faculty of Public Health Awards and Welcome event. I'm joining you here today from the amazing setting of the Town Hall in Liverpool. As President of the UK Faculty of Public Health, I was asked to join Liverpool colleagues today as they are having their own thank you event tonight for all the work that was done by public health teams and many of the other people working to, uh, to keep the city safe, particularly during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's a real pleasure to be sitting in the Lord Mayor's office and I'm delighted to be able to um, speak to you today from this amazing setting. I just wish you were with me and you could see how, how lovely uh, how lovely it is here and how welcoming the people of Liverpool have been. If I could have the next slide, please. So I am delighted that you're able to join us today. This is uh, an opportunity to welcome our new honorary and distinction members and also celebrate our prize winners and other award winners who have been nominated by members and fellows of the faculty. Sadly, due to COVID-19, we did not hold an awards ceremony last year, and we will therefore be celebrating our new members and prize winners from both 2020 and 2021. I mentioned earlier that it'd probably be helpful for the, um, the smooth running of this event if you could keep your cameras off unless you're, you're um, supposed to be visible to this event and also to mute, to mute yourself. That would be extremely helpful. And just to remind you that this event is being recorded. I think that's very important for all of you that have been able to join today. You'll have um, a memoir of this event, this very important event, but also for those colleagues who unfortunately weren't able to join us at this time today, we can put that event recorded version out to them so they can enjoy and, and join in the celebrations too. Now, obviously as president of the faculty, I couldn't do this job on my own and the hundreds of members who support the faculty, I want to give my sincere thanks. There's also the faculty board who work tirelessly to support the business of the faculty. And most importantly, the officer colleagues who work with me on a more day-to-day -day basis and James Gore and the staff. So my sincere thanks colleagues, you've certainly made my job much, much easier. And to be honest, I really wouldn't know what to do without you. I certainly wouldn't be able to do this job as your president. So I'm delighted to, um, to welcome my colleagues. And I, first of all, want to check if John Newton, our vice president is here, and I'd like John to introduce himself. I know that John was having problems earlier with joining this call. So John, if you're there, if you'd like to introduce yourself. So sadly colleagues, it seems that John is still trying to join. I'm, I'm sure he will persevere because he's got one or two tasks that we've delegated to him later on in the, the session. So if I could now then, um, John Newton, Professor John Newton is the Vice President of the Faculty. As I say, hopefully you'll see John later. I'd like to now go to my colleague, Geary. <coughs> Geary, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Maggie. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Giri Rajaratnam. I'm the faculty registrar and I deal with workforce related issues such as the appointment processes and so on and so forth. Uh, in my day job, uh, I'm the deputy regional director for the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities in the Midlands. Um, that particular office is part of uh, the Department of Health and Social Care and of course came into being uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you very much, Gary, and for all you do. Could I now ask Sally, Sally Pearson, to introduce herself, please? 
Hi then, thanks Maggie. I'm Sally Pearson. I'm the assistant registrar, which means that I support Giri in his role, but I take um, the leading in um, workforce issues with external partners. Um, <clears throat> in my day job, I'm the responsible officer for NHS Resolution and I also chair the Southwest Clinical Senate. Thank you so much, Sally. And uh, David Chappell? Hello, I'm David Chappell. I'm the academic registrar, so I oversee the uh, education and training work of the faculty. Thank you so much, David. And Samia Litty. Samia? Hi, everyone. I'm Samia. Um, I'm the assistant academic registrar, and I support David and the education committee in all the work that the faculty does. Thank you, Samia. And Ellis? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ellis Friedman, and I am the treasurer of the faculty. And as the name implies, I deal with all of the financial matters relating to the faculty. And James. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Gore. I'm the chief executive of the faculty. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And a big thank you to you and your, um, what after all is a small, relatively small group of staff for, for the amazing work the faculty does. So thank you, James. You and your staff do an amazing job. I'm, um, unfortunately, um, Professor Neil Squires, our international registrar, has, uh, has not been able to join us. He is hoping to join us later on today. So we'll look forward to welcoming Neil to this meeting. Before I move on to the main business of this event, this award ceremony, I'm absolutely delighted that Professor Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer for England, was able to join us today. And I'd like to pass to Chris, who's agreed to say a few words for us. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Uh, thanks, Maggie. I mean, I, really, uh, the obvious thing to say is a massive thank you to everybody who's fa faculty fellows and members and those who support them. Uh, I mean, the last two years, and we're definitely not through it yet, has been the most challenging for public health for certainly in our generation um, in terms of a new and really extraordinary challenge. What it has demonstrated to the entire population, I think, is the importance of public health in dealing with emergencies. Uh, and uh, the ability and the extraordinary uh, ability of our colleagues all around the country to turn their hands from one thing to a completely different thing. People moving from cardiovascular disease suddenly to uh, contact tracing and finding things to organising vaccination uh, programmes in deprived communities. You know, really extraordinary public health of a sort that will be, I think, looked back on as a real achievement by uh, people in the future. This is a period when public health has really shone. Um, second thing to say is I think the faculty and very much uh, under your leadership, Maggie, has as a group played a very important role in helping to set the agenda, to hold people to account and to make sure that we actually have a constructive but challenging relationship between uh, public health and those who are working in uh, executive roles, which I think is a very important part of public health job. The ability to constructively hold people to account really is part of the job. Uh, the third thing is there's going to be a huge process of um, uh, re recovery uh, for individuals, for families, for communities and for the country. Um, and what this uh, has shone, as always, is a light on poverty and deprivation and inequality around the country. Uh, and the same people who have been at the greatest risk of COVID are also the same people at the greatest risk of smoking related diseases, obesity related diseases and all the diseases of deprivation. Uh, concentrated in particular places and dealing with entrenched deprivation across all the areas of public health is central to what everybody in public health is doing. So it really is just to say really extraordinary work will continue. We're going to have to shift back to having to deal with all the non-communicable diseases in addition to a long tail of COVID. COVID is not going to go away obviously for uh, uh, probably our professional lifetimes. Um, and I could not be more grateful or more proud to be part of the public health community at this point in time. Thank you so, so very, very much, Chris, for those very kind words. And we are incredibly lucky to have you and, and other colleagues who would be willing to take on the jobs that you're taking on. I think we, um, we know 
that the senior leadership jobs in advising government is, is a challenge. It's a challenge in the UK. It's a challenge across the world. And I really um, applaud the dedication and you, you and your colleagues who are doing similar jobs across the UK. So thank you so much for joining us. And what people don't see, Chris, is the amount of time that, that we, we have with you. You're very, very generous with your time. And I think everyone in public health in England has benefited from that. Our directors of public health, our regional directors, and indeed myself and the other presidents of the Academy of Royal Colleges. The time you've spent with us has been, um, has been extremely valuable. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So colleagues, if we could move on please to the next slide. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the, um, the main body of the reason we've gathered today for this event. This is the welcome to new honorary and distinction members for 2020 and 2021. And we'll work through the, this agenda, we'll work through these nominations, these, um, these important um, positions within the faculty now, uh, so that everyone gets a chance to enjoy the moment and to celebrate the achievements. As I said, it's um, with great regret, regret that we're not doing face-to-face -face events, but we very much hope that we'll be welcoming you, the people who are at the receiving end of these awards, we'll be welcoming you to some sort of face-to-face -face reception next year when things hopefully will be better and it'll be safer to do so. And we'll try and get those dates out to you as quickly as possible. But we didn't want to not have some sort of recognition and celebration for this, these support, important achievements. So each year, fellows of the Faculty of Public Health are invited to nominate outstanding individuals for distinctions and honorary grades of membership. And these membership grades are as follows. Practitioner membership through distinction, membership through distinction, fellowship through distinction, honorary membership and honorary fellowship. And we're very, very dependent on faculty, faculty fellows for these nominations. Um, as president of the faculty, I can work with um, my colleagues, my officer colleagues, Geary and others to oversee this process but in actual fact, I can't nominate anyone myself. So we will be very, very dependent on fellows and any fellows that are listening today, um, we're just about to start the process for next year. So we are reliant on you to help us and we're very grateful for everything you do. So through these routes, the faculty recognizes those who have made a significant contribution to the science, literature or practice of public health raising the profile of public health and indeed the work of the faculty itself. The last time we um, tried to count the number of members who were in some way involved in supporting the faculty by doing various roles and taking on responsibility all on a voluntary basis, we had the region of 500. So we're extremely grateful, but we're always welcoming of new, new, um, new involvement. So if any of you would like to get more involved, then please do contact either James or myself. So we'd like to take the opportunity, as I say, to thank those fellows who have nominated their colleagues for membership. And now I'm just going to work through these, um, se these uh, sections in detail. Next slide, please. So practitioner membership through distinction. This is our first category. Practitioner membership through distinction is awarded to practitioners working in core public health practice, policy or research who have made a significant contribution to public health. We are very pleased to welcome Christopher Nugent, who was admitted to practitioner membership through distinction in 2020. And I would like to invite you all to give Christopher, a round of applause, either virtual or um, joining me in clapping Christopher's achievements. Very well done, Christopher. 
And Christopher, I don't know if you're there. You're very welcome to put on your, your camera if, if you are. I am indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very well done, uh, Christopher. And we do, I do consider practitioners to be very important. I was a practitioner myself once upon a time. So I'm delighted that we've been able to recognise this and very, very well done. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could move on to our next category, please. So our second category is membership through distinction. Our second category, membership through distinction, is awarded to individuals, again, working in core public health practice, policy or research, at an above master's degree level, who have made significant contributions to public health. Again, I would like to invite you to join me in welcoming our new members through distinction. We're just going to pause for a few minutes, um, we've got our 2020 and 2021 members through distinctions. So we're just going to pause for a few minutes so we can get a chance to um, take in all the names. If you forgive me, I won't read um, out all the names because of the length of time, uh, the shortness of the time we have for this event, sadly. But I do want you to uh, look at all those uh, names and take a moment to just think about how much they've done to achieve this recognition. And it's a great privilege and pleasure to see so many people I know on this list. And similar to the other awards we're giving out tonight, we very much hope that in 2022, we'll be able to offer you some sort of face-to-face -face reception if, if safety allows, and we look forward to welcoming you to that. So now, if you'd like to join me in applauding all of our colleagues in the members, members through distinction category for 2020 and 2021. And if I can move to the next slide, please. Now, fellows through distinction, I'm first of all going to talk about those who achieved this award in 2020. And then I'll move on to this award in 2021. So our third category is Fellowship Through Distinction, which is awarded to individuals working in core public health practice, policy or research at consultant level, or who have made an outstanding contribution to public health. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our new Fellows Through Distinction who were admitted to membership in 2021. And again, let's pause colleagues and just make sure we have time so that we can recognize all the names on this slide and really recognize the fantastic achievement they have made. So extremely well done, colleagues. And again, would you like to join me in congratulating our colleagues? And if I could move to the next slide, please. Speaking. And I think if I could advise, I think we've got a little bit of background noise. If someone, whoever's speaking, could just mute themselves, please. Thank you. So our next category is, again, Fellowship Through Distinction. And these are our awards for 2021. I think if you look at the significant amount of colleagues who've been nominated, I think it demonstrates that public health is at the forefront right across the world. And again, this category, the same as the 2020 category, is, through, is to be awarded fellowship through distinction, which is those working in public health at consultant level, either for health practice policy or research. 
And let's just give ourselves a few moments just to read through these names, and then we can celebrate and congratulate these colleagues. Again, it's very, very rewarding to see so, so many public health colleagues getting this distinction. Absolutely excellent and many, many congratulations. Shall we, shall we show our appreciation colleagues? Let's give them a round of applause. And let's move on to the next category, please. So um, this next category is our honorary membership in 2020 and 2021. We have two honorary grades of membership in the faculty, honorary membership and honorary fellowship. And I'll move on to honorary fellowship later in this session. Honorary membership is awarded to individuals who normally do not work in core public health, but have made a significant contribution to the science, literature, or practice of public health or have rendered a major service to the Faculty of Public Health. In this category, we are, um, our standing orders allow us to have 15 honorary memberships can be awarded each year. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our new Thank honorary you. members who were admitted to the faculty, both in 2020 and 2021. So let's just pause a few minutes and uh, recognize the fantastic achievements of all those receiving honorary members, membership. And if you are a fellow of the faculty and you would like to think about making nominations, then we're getting to the time of year where your services are required. So you will find out more about that in the faculty e-bulletin. So colleagues, if you would like to join me in giving a round of applause to all those who have received honorary membership in 2020 and 2021, many congratulations. We move to the next category, please. So this brings us to the honorary fellows for 2020 and 2021. Honorary Fellowship is the faculty's highest category of membership and is awarded to individuals who have made an outstanding contribution to improving the health of the public, improving the practice of public health and or contributing to the remit of the Faculty of Public Health. In each calendar year, we are allowed to have 10 honorary fellowships. And it is with great pleasure that I am delighted to um, show you this slide today with both our 2020 Honorary Fellows and those who received who are receiving Honorary Fellowship in 2021. And again, let's pause for a few minutes and just get a chance to look through these names and recognize the fantastic achievements of everyone in this category. So many, many congratulations, colleagues. And if you'd like to join me in, in giving them a round of applause, thank you. And if we could move on, please. Now, obviously, because we are very conscious of the fact that you're doing this uh, event uh, as a digital, uh, on a digital platform. And we would have ideally liked everyone to have time to speak, but given that we would probably keep you here all night, 
we have compromised and we've particularly asked some of our honorary uh, fellows and others to say a few words about the importance of public health. So I'm absolutely delighted that Professor Dame Leslie Regan, who I worked very closely with when uh, Leslie was uh, president of the Royal College of Ops and Gynae, delighted to welcome Leslie to, first of all, to say a few words and a real pleasure to see you, Leslie. Well, thank you very much, Maggie. And thank you to now the people I can call my, my, my fellow colleagues at the Faculty of Public Health. This is an enormous honour and I feel very, very privileged to be here today and to have received this nomination. So I took a bit of a bet, Maggie, and um, that, that you would have lots of discussion about the importance of public health living in this COVID pandemic, which we're, we're, we're learning to live with now. So I thought I would say something a little bit different. Um, as an obstetrician and gynaecologist, I work in a craft specialty um, and I'm also of an age when I was really trained to work in a disease intervention service. And like many people in my specialty, I got very interested in a particular, I now realize very small niche of obstetrics and gynecology. I became very interested in recurrent pregnancy loss and stillbirth. Very, very important. Um, but actually what I then much more later in my career, and that was actually 2010 when I first heard Sir Michael Marmot speaking, uh, and reporting on his study, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, that I, I had a sort of a light bulb moment thinking, my goodness, I've got this enormous privilege of having a job that allows me to care for women and girls across their life course. But I've only really fe fe featured or figured rather, or, or, or focused, I should say, on things that have gone wrong. Uh, because, you know, when you're an obstetrician, you tend to get drawn into the pregnancies where there are complications, not the normal pregnancies. And I could give you lots of other examples. So I became very, very interested in the fact that the medicine I've been trained to deliver in an acute tertiary unit uh, was actually only a third of the solution and that the other two thirds were really all rooted in public health and the social determinants of, of, of health. And that's when I became really interested in, in thinking, oh, I think we've really got to change the way we deliver healthcare in my specialty of obstetrics and gynaecology, which is when I became interested in trying to do something about changing policy. And then I realized I needed to get into a position where I could try and influence it, which is why I went for election firstly as vice president and then as president of the RCOG. And I think that it really is thanks to people like you, Maggie, who've been so generous with your time uh, and helping guide us at the RCOG and what we could do to improve girls and women's health across their life course. And always, always we came back to the fact that the really important things, the things that affected every girl and every woman that you and I know were all rooted in good public health. So it's an enormous honour to receive this fellowship for me. Um, and I feel very, very lucky that even though it was late in my career, that it was at a time when I could still put some energy and enthusiasm uh, into trying to make obstetrics and gynaecology much more public health focused. And I think we've, we've partly succeeded. So I'm going to stop there, but thank you again for this great honor. And it's a real pleasure to know that I will have even more lovely excuses to ring you up and your, your colleagues to ask for your advice and help and guidance uh, in, in the next stages of, of what I'm going to be doing professionally. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. That was a, a, a very, very kind and really insightful message because it's always been my belief that everyone needs is a public health specialist. They just don't realise it until they finally get there. But, you know, you've been so generous of spirit, a great support to me and my presidency. And I know I could turn to you at any point for any advice and support and help. And you've been a most generous colleague, but a great, great, you know, opportunity for us to congratulate you and bestow this honour on you, Leslie. It's very well deserved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to um, move my me to uh, Dr. Jose Figuera. Uh, Jose is Director of the European Observatory on Health Systems and uh, Policy. It seems a long, long time since we met face-to-face, -face, Jose, but delighted to welcome you and delighted that you've agreed to say a few words for us. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. What can I say? Anything I would say would be an understatement, really. It's 
have an enormous debt of gratitude to to you guys in England and uh, in the UK. Actually, I, I was virtually best friend, uh, best best fit, <laughs> fit with uh, with public health in the UK, studying LSHTM and then as uh, staff there. So I, I, it's a delightful, it's wonderful for me to have this kind of linkage. Actually, we have two partners of the observatory uh, come from the UK, the UK Department of Health and the Health Foundation. And I want to only say that I hope I will carry this fellowship uh, positively and looks reflects positively on the faculty and you will not regret it. And indeed, I'm very, very happy if I can in any way, form or shape, have value added in your work uh, and, and to members of the faculty, please do call on us. You asked us, you asked a couple of minutes, a couple of reflections about the importance of the public health profession. I think my perspective in this case would be taking an European perspective. I mentioned actually a study that we're going to be presenting in the European uh, Public Health Conference this year that we're doing with the WHO and the observatory and asked for actually John Middleton today in the list of awardees as well as the former president of the faculty and now president of ASFER, uh, with UFA, as I said, uh, and Martin McKee, actually another one today. We are looking at um, public health during the crisis and how it has responded and what are the opportunities to strengthen public health. And I wanted perhaps in this minute I got left to reflect on some of these areas. Clearly, uh, it has shown the importance of public health. That goes without saying but also has shown an opportunity to strengthen our profession clearly. Falling into the topical Churchillian quote, so too much quoted uh, topic about never waste a good crisis, I would say, well, we have been wasting many crises for the reform of our systems and in public health as well to strengthen our profession. And I hope we're not going to waste this one. And, and I think this, this, this crisis is giving us a great opportunity to show what we do and what we can do. And in this analysis we've been doing, we are doing as we speak and we'll be presenting, as I say, as I said in the European uh, Public Health Conference, there are four important elements that we need to work on, we need to strengthen, and we have a great opportunity to make our case. One is in many countries, public health institutional capacity has been weak. And on those countries where it's the opposite, we've seen, needless to say, uh, a, a real impact. So the extent to which public health institution, institutions have been ingrained, linked uh, to, the, to, the, to the governance, to the public health, to the decision making on health, it has made a huge difference. And the crisis allows us to make a very, very powerful case for investing on these institutions. And linked to that, the second point is the role of public health. I mean, I'm biased there perhaps, but the evidence I think shows me right on knowledge brokering, on the transparency, on the governance. And the fact that public health is not just epidemiology, it's behavioral sciences, it's economics, it's communication, it's so many other things. When we are in these multidisciplinary teams, affecting policy, knowledge brokering, and actually the, the SAGE and independent SAGE in the UK is a very good example of how one could do things. And we have many other examples in other member states, good and bad examples. But how do we strengthen this knowledge brokering, this, this, this transparency, this governance from the evidence to practice, but also let's not forget our advocacy role which has been key during the crisis. And in the advocacy and the evidence, the situation, my third point, and I only got four, Maggie, I'm going to wrap up very quickly. My third point is about the vulnerable populations. As always, they bear the brunt of any crisis, the financial crisis, the refugee crisis, and the COVID crisis. And public health with our evidence, our information, our advocacy has been key in showing where these populations are, how are they suffering, and the kinds of interventions we can put in place. And finally, linked to that, really, and this advocacy, public health has an impact to the extent that not only we, we are knowledge brokers with policymakers, but our ability to communicate to the general population. I know what I'm doing, what I'm saying is not rocket science, but there are huge differences between different member states, different countries, about the role of public health being there, newspapers, tweeting, talking to the general population, denouncing, showing evidence, and supporting as well 
when the interventions are in the right direction. So anyway, I hope has some value added to make us feel better about what we are, what we do, and have even more impetus to keep making a case for our, for our uh, profession, for our institutions. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so much, Rosie. Again, a, a wonderful, wonderful message. And uh, it's so important in these times that we in the UK are very connected to Europe. And of course, we have members right across the, the whole world. So thank you for, for your generosity uh, with that message. And also recognising our, our colleague, uh, John Middleton, also a honorary fellow of the faculty, our previous president, Martin McKee, other fantastic players in this space. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce um, Deborah Arnott. Uh, again, a real pleasure to work with um, Deborah. I've been working with Deborah over the years and great joy to work with her as president of the faculty. Deborah's chief executive of Action on Smoking and Health. Over to you, Deborah. Thank you, Maggie. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, I, you know, uh, public health is finally getting the recognition it deserves. So I feel particularly privileged to be recognized by the faculty at this time. And amongst such illustrious colleagues, um, such as Chris Whitty and almost as well known Greta Thunberg and Marcus Rashford. Um, I've come on a journey since I joined ASH in 2003 when I had no experience in public health. And I was only able to do that through the support of the public health community. Um, the, you know, I am an advocate. Jose was talking about advocacy, and I completely agree how important it is. But advocates like myself can only succeed by working in coalition. And the faculty is a really important member of the alliance we put together to secure comprehensive smoke-free legislation. That network, the SFAC, continues to this day and most recently played an important role in securing the government's smoke-free 2030 ambition. I'll talk a bit more about smoking because that's what's got me to where I am today. In 2007, when the smoke-free laws came into force, our smoking rates were average for Europe. A decade later, they were less than half that of the EU 27. That is a major victory for public health. It's only public health that made that difference. Um, and great though that is, there's still so much more to do. Smoking remains responsible for half the difference in life expectancy between rich and poor in our communities. And we're not on track to achieve that, that government ambition for a smoke-free 2030. If the widely anticipated white paper on disparities is be, to be effective, public health in general, but smoking and ending smoking in particular must be at its heart. As you can see, public health has become my passion, which is why I'm still at ASH. It's also why when the abolition of Public Health England was announced, Ash stepped up to help coordinate a unified joint position on what should replace it. Our experience on tobacco taught us that to be successful, we need to be united. I want to thank my colleague and deputy Hazel Cheeseman for all she did to support that work. And before long, I would hope to see her honored by the FPH as I have been. We were delighted in that work to work with the faculty and particularly you, Maggie, who played such an important role. And we secured a joint position on the future of health improvement, supported by over 100 um, organisations. We're very pleased to see that many of our recommendations have been adopted in the structure of OHID. But we all, as members of the faculty and as the public health community, now need to hold OHID to account to ensure that it delivers in practice what has been promised in principle. And that's what I see as a really important part of the future of public health going forward. Thank you so very, very much, uh, Deborah. And your leadership has been absolutely outstanding. And as well as Helen Cheeseman, I, I must recognise the input of Helen Walters, who's been really significant in leading a lot of the, the work for the Faculty of Public Health. So again, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Helen, uh, the two Helens and everyone else that's helped with this agenda. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Professor Jackie Taylor, who is president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. And again, over the last 18 months, I've got to know um, Jackie very, very well, mostly on Teams calls, but somehow we've, we've bonded. And it was a great privilege and pleasure to join Jackie last week in, in Scotland, 
where we actually had a chance to, to meet face to face. So thank you so, so much for taking the time to join us. And we're delighted to have bestowed Honorary Fellowship on you, Jackie, for all your fantastic achievements. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maggie, for inviting me. Uh, and I'm absolutely thrilled and, and very honoured to have been awarded this Honorary Fellowship and delighted to be able to be with you, albeit virtually today. Uh, and as I think one of the previous speakers said, in such illustrious company, it is indeed incredibly humbling. It's interesting, I think if we look over the last 18 months, the importance of, of public health and of this faculty has become really very, very clear. It's really been brought into sharp relief. I suspect if we'd asked even some of our fellow professionals, they might not have fully understood what public health medicine actually involves. And perhaps many of people in, in our communities had never heard of public health. Well, my goodness, they have certainly heard of it now. Um, I think the faculty in particular, Maggie's played a hugely important role in influencing and modulating the, the response to the pandemic that we've seen. The advice that's been given really has been pearls of wisdom. And I think it's done a fantastic job shaping the agenda, being that critical, constructive friend offering gentle challenge where it was necessary. And I think we must acknowledge your role in that. Certainly the faculty has shown great leadership. Your members and fellows have shown great leadership in their own workplaces. But as an individual, I think you've shown incredible um, wisdom and leadership and we're very grateful for that. As a clinician, I I've actually spent my entire working life really uh, in, in Glasgow and in and around Glasgow, just seeing uh, the impact on a daily basis of poor choices and lack of opportunities, of substance abuse, poor housing, lack of education, poor employment opportunities, of exclusion, of deprivation, and as a geriatrician, of premature ageing as well. So... But in juxtaposition for, uh, to that, we've also seen the successes in public health. We've seen the, um, what the amazing campaigns can do, what the specialty can do. We've heard about smoking, um, the minimum pricing of alcohol, highlighting concerns about obesity, all the fantastic vaccination programmes, all of the uh, risk factor management. So lots has been done, but there is still much to do. And I think during my clinical life, I've just become so much more aware and committed to the importance of getting upstream of this pathology. As clinicians, we always say prevention is better than cure. But I, I think we are now much more voted, motivated to really try and achieve that. And my priorities as president have been well-being and inclusivity, as you know, and I think uh, public health and the faculty of, of of um, uh, public health medicine has just so, such a large part to play in that. And it will continue to be really pivotal in the recovering of health and the recovering of healthcare services and in reducing the health inequalities that, that Chris mentioned earlier. They are becoming ever wider and that is going to need a concerted effort across all the domains of government and from each of us as individuals through our colleges and organisations and, 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 and across societies. Uh, I looked at your website or our website, I'm proud to say our website now, and the aim of the faculty is to improve the health and well-being of local communities and the health of populations. What a wonderful aim. But that's an aim that should be shared by all of us. And we need the Faculty of Public Health to be that continuing clear, clear voice providing expertise and leading us through those monumental changes that lie ahead. So thank you for giving me this privilege. I am truly, truly thrilled. Thank you so much, uh, Jackie, for your very, very kind words and everything you do. And we are very proud 
um, to have you as our parent college alongside RCP Edinburgh and RCP London. And it's wonderful to connect with you in this way. And you really deserve this, this honour for everything you've done and especially putting health inequalities at the heart of everything you do. So thank you so much, very much appreciated. And now I'd like to welcome um, Professor Jason Leach, uh, who is the National Clinical Director of Scottish Government. And I'm particularly pleased that Jason is with us today. I know that he is supposed to be on leave this week and he's managed to sneak us in to, to his uh, holiday period, which we're ever so grateful for. Jason, and really, Jason, I've got to know you from watching the television, because you've been on the television rather a lot, haven't you? But it's been great to hear you as the voice of Scotland. And I'll hand over to you now to say a few words. Maggie, you're very kind. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm very happy to in it, it interrupt a, a few days off for, for such an honour. It does feel like a genuinely important moment for me as a professional. Uh, but, but also broadly, because of what everybody else has said around public health, let me start by echoing Chris's comments right at the beginning on behalf of everybody in Scotland, thanking the faculty, both your Scottish representatives who have been very prominent here, you can be absolutely certain, but also the broader UK membership, fellowship and staff and those who support those staff. It has been absolutely invaluable. I, I am a, I, I, I'm pretending to be a public health expert. And the only way you can pretend to be a public health, health expert is if you have actual public health experts behind you. So, so I do uh, now have a slightly notorious MPH because I used it to slap down Piers Morgan on, on one particularly infamous occasion. But it was, in the words of some of your fellows who I know well, MPH light, because I did it in the Harvard summer programme. The great thing about the Harvard summer program is, though, that the Harvard professors don't want to teach. So they all come and teach the summer program so they can get it over with fast. So I, I, I got the definitive social epidemiology teachers. I got the best statistics teachers in the world. It was a, an astonishing educational experience and, and did introduce me to formal public health training. I was a dentist and then an oral surgeon for many years. And let me just in passing mention that the biggest and most serious, completely preventable disease in the world is dental caries. And the Faculty of Public Health and many of your dental public health members have done huge amounts of work, including in Scotland, to try and stop that scourge, particularly the inequalities at the heart of that scourge across the world. So very quickly, I've had three jobs in the pandemic, all of which have required the support of real public health experts behind me. They're the most important and most obvious is to advise our government, like, like Chris, like Susan Hopkins, who is here today, and, and others. And I couldn't have done that without Jim McMenon, without Marion Bain, without fellows and members like you, Maggie, and, and others who have provided the actual advice for then the slightly extrovert, brave guy to go into the room with the First Minister and actually share said advice up, up the chain. That's not perhaps everybody's cup of tea, but I always felt very well supported and very well educated. And then my other two jobs have been more public facing. The media, the I think at last count, 800 media interviews in, in 18 months to try and translate what we were doing and saying as four countries, as one country, into a language that particularly the public service broadcasters could use. Fer Fergus is going to speak next. And I, I, I honestly, not because he's going to speak next, I think both the BBC and in my world, STV, not ITV, have played an absolute blinder in the main in sharing what has been really crucial public health information, be it adverts, be it the Fergus Walsh embedded in an intensive care unit, be it vaccination, be it interviews, on the Marshall or the Scottish equivalent of the Marshall. And then my third, and I think crucial role for public health has been the stakeholder groups. I, I've done quite a lot of invisible communication with colleagues to schools, to head teachers, to HIV Scotland, to Scottish Football Association. There are half a million young people and parents involved in grassroots football in Scotland. That's a tenth of the country. If you can persuade a tenth of the country to get vaccinated or to get tested, then you've gone a long way to embedding that public health behaviour inside 
your population. So I'm hugely grateful for both public health people and public health help. And they've helped me hugely. So I hope to be able to give something back, Maggie. And I'm hugely grateful for the faculty in recognizing me in this way for what has been a completely inadequate performance, but I've done it with the best of intentions. The, I have quite a lot of Twitter trolling, as a number of others on this uh, group have. But one of the most popular troll lines is, he's just a dentist. Well, now I intend to reply, he may just be a dentist, but he has a membership of the Faculty of Public Health so they can just shut up. So thank you so much for having me, Mike. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. And uh, what, what, a, what a humble humble message you've given there when the natural fact, well, you, you are an expert and you do a jo your job fantastically well. And that's what's been recognised uh, tonight, uh, how well you do your job. And you are in, in the faculty now. So, um, so we'll give that to Piers Morgan to, um, to deal with is what I see into the future. But thank you. And thank you for recognising the other colleagues who contribute, Jim and Marion, uh, Julie Kavanagh, and, and obviously other colleagues who are here tonight, Susan Hopkins and others. I think that's just fantastic. So thank you very, very much indeed. So um, moving on then to our next, uh, our next colleague, who, um, for those of you that watch the BBC, uh, will be a well-known figure, Fergus Walsh. Um, Fergus, I think, was um, particularly nominated um, by fellows of the faculty because when there was a lot of misinformation and uh, not a lot of clarity, Fergus did give fantastic performances on really getting to the heart of what was happening in COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, Fergus was very worried that he would not be able to join us tonight because as you imagine, being a medical editor for the BBC, your life is not your own. So rather than run the risk of not being able to be with us tonight, he very kindly recorded a little video for us. And I would ask colleagues if they can show that video now, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor to be made a member of the Faculty of Public Health. Now, I'm not in the BBC studios today. I'm at Oxford Eye Hospital, where I've been filming uh, a new innovative procedure that's been taking place here. So I can take this off now. So I've just come out of the operating theater. Um, for me, the coronavirus pandemic has underlined the importance of public health. And what I've spent most of the pandemic doing is trying to help inform people about the nature of coronavirus, the threat it poses, the symptoms of the disease, uh, the essential elements of social distancing, and of course, the importance of immunization. But I hope everything goes well today. And once again, thank you very much for making me an honorary member. So if I could move on to the presentation of prizes and awards for 2020 and 2021, and the celebration of our prize, prize and award winners. So each year, the Faculty of Public Health presents a number of prizes and awards, many of which have been donated from former presidents, members and members of the faculty. They are in recognition of exceptional achievements in service to public health, our outstanding contribution to the work of the faculty. We are very pleased to celebrate our prize and award winners for both 2020 and 2021. And also tonight, we will have three of our award donors, um, Sean Griffiths, Lindsay Davis, and James McEwen, all previous presidents of the faculty who've joined us tonight, and they will be with us when it comes time to those awards. What we'd like to do is to ask award winners and presenters to turn on their cameras and unmute as we get to each award. The presenter will deliver a short citation and then we will invite the winners to, um, to join us to just put their camera on, this, on, on and have a chance to congratulate them. Again, due to timing, I, we won't have time to have any thank you speeches tonight and we've selected just one or two people to give thanks at the end of this session. So if I could ask um, Sally Pearson and George Baker, please, to turn on their cameras and I'll hand over to Sally. Thank you. Just wait for George to appear. 
Lovely. Hi there, George. So, um, the Cochrane Prize um, is named in honour of the faculty's first president, Professor Archie Cochrane, who held the office from 1972 to 1975. This prize is open to undergraduate students and provides funding for an educational activity in the field of public health. I'm really pleased to present this award to George Barker for his work on relationships and sex education in schools. For six years at university, George has been involved in Sex Expression, a student-led near-peer teaching programme which is based in universities throughout the UK. George has worked as lead coordinator, overseeing the day-to-day -day running of the programme and the delivery of sessions in schools. Congratulations, George, on your award. Thank you very much. Thank you. So could we show our appreciation colleagues and do a round of applause for George? Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed, Sally and George. Many congratulations, George. If now we could move on to the next slide, please. And this is the Sir John Rotherson Prize. And I'm delighted that um, our Vice President of the Faculty, um, sorry, um, I, yes, I'm delighted that John, John Newton, sorry, John, I know you weren't with yes. us earlier. Thank, thank you for managing and persevering to get on. Delighted to welcome Professor John Newton, our Vice President, to read the citation. Thank you. Yeah, th <clears throat> thank you very much, Maggie. I hope <clears throat> everyone can hear me. Um, so, yes, the Sir John Brotherson Prize was established in honour of the faculty's third president, and it's awarded for an essay or research on a public health topic, and it's open to students and young graduates. And we had a really strong field this time. Um, so uh, I'm absolutely delighted to present this award to Isabel Wellen uh, for her outstanding essay entitled Austerity, NHS Reform and Vaccine Uptake. And in this essay, she explored the complex issues around vaccine uptake and the impact of austerity and health services on health service restructure. I have to say, it was an extremely elegant piece of work. It was beautifully written and uh, really interesting. I mean, well, well above the standard of many publications that we see. So I think it was a, a extremely thoughtful analysis. Um, it was submitted to the faculty in early 2020. So of course, it preceded the widespread discourse which we've had over the past 18 months on vaccines <laughs> and vaccine hesitancy. But I have to say, it was one of the best things I've read about vaccine uh, hesitancy, despite that. So, well, well, very well done to Isabel. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, many, many congratulations, Isabel. Should we show our, um, our appreciation by giving a round of applause to Isabel? Thank you so much, John, for that excellent citation. Very well done. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. And if I could ask now, if um, we could move on to the next prize, please. And this is the Michael O'Brien Prize. And again, we have three winners in this category. Um, if we could ask Samuel Latif, Helen and uh, Kat to put on their cameras, please. Thank you. And I just wanted to check you were still with us, Kat. Um, uh, we've asked Kat to say a few words and we're just bringing that ahead in the programme. But if you, uh, if Sammy, if you could please read the citation. I will do. Um, well done. Uh, so we have three winners here for the Michael O'Brien Prize, which was donated by Dr. O'Brien when he left the office as faculty president in 1995. And it is awarded to the speciality registrar who receives the highest score in the sitting of the faculty public health diplomat exam, previously known as Part A. So I'm delighted to present this award to Dr. Uh, to Manish Sharma in absentia for scoring um, the highest numbers in the Jan 2020 sitting. Unfortunately, I know Manoj can't be with us. Um, <laughs> And then we've got Kat and Helen, Kat for the highest score in the November 2020 sitting and Helen for the highest score in the March 2021 sitting. So congratulations. Well done on your outstanding performance. Thank you so much. And if we can um, applaud our winners, please. Thank you very much. Indeed. 
Thank you so much. And um, I think for, for those people that will remember my, um, my statement when I um, put in my papers to become president, I said that I wanted to bring the registrars of the faculty, um, SPRs in the faculty centre stage in everything we do. So I've particularly wanted tonight, um, while we have many amazing colleagues in public health speaking, I particularly wanted to, <laughs> to have a, a few words from one of our specialty registrars, and I've asked Kat to say a few words, if you'd like to say a few words now, Kat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie, and I can um, confirm that you have done an amazing job into bringing our issues to the forefront of the agenda of uh, the FPH, and we are very thankful because we know we can count on you, and whenever we experience any difficulties during training, particularly because of COVID and the impact that has had on our training, we can always count with the faculty to support us and to discuss with us adjustments, etc. So it has been a really good experience to work with you and work with everyone in the, in the faculty. And I'm, I wanted to really thank you and everyone who helped us during the pandemic to still be able to do the exams. It is very challenging to conciliate our workload with uh, revising for exams. And a lot of people also have family issues. So all the support we got from everyone involved, all the people who support who are on the backstage that are really key to ensure that the exam runs smoothly and uh, the integrity is preserved, even if they are done uh, remotely. And finally, I would like to emphasize that um, this has been really a good time for inclusion. And as someone with a long-term condition that is disabling, the fact that a lot of things now happen online has really widened access to people like me who would not be able to be in London today if the event was um, in person. So it's really important that as we move forward and as we emerge on the other side of the pandemic, that we don't forget about people with disabilities and keep hybrid ways of uh, social interaction to ensure that people are not left behind because above all, above all, in public health, we fight inequalities and inequalities are at all levels and are also among us. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kat. And you've given an incredibly kind and generous message, but we need to thank you because you are helping with so many things for the faculty. And I think public health registrars have done an outstanding job uh, as many of you know, I run a training programme in the Southwest. I, I meet many registrars from across the UK and they've just done an absolutely amazing job, an outstanding job. Resilience has been amazing in spite of a very challenging period. So thank you so much, Kat, and to you and all your colleagues, a very big thank you. So um, if we could move on then, colleagues, if we may, thank you. So this next award, I am... Absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Jim McEwen, uh, previous president of the faculty. Uh, Jim has been an outstanding support to me, and uh, that's in the early part of my career. But also when I took up the president of the faculty role, uh, Jim and, and other past presidents reached out to offer help and support. So a real pleasure to see you today, Jim, and I'd like to hand over to you for the citation, please. Thank you very much indeed, Maggie. I'm very pleased to be joining this event today and to present the McEwen Award, which I gifted to the faculty when I demitted office as president in 2001, which seems a very long time ago indeed. The award is presented to the specialty registrar who receives the highest annual score in the faculty's final membership in their first attempt. I'm delighted to present this award to Thomas Callender for his outstanding performance in this exam. Congratulations, Thomas. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very, very much indeed. And if we could uh, applaud uh, Thomas for this outstanding achievement. And thank you so much for, for joining us, Jim, for that lovely, lovely reading of the citation and to congratulate Thomas. Let's show our congratulations to Thomas, colleagues. Thank you. And I just finally wish Thomas a very enjoyable and successful career in public health. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, and for everything you've done to support so many of us in, in over the years. We're very, very grateful. Thank you. Next, next award, please. So again, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ellis Friedman, our treasurer, who you met earlier today, and Ellis is going to read the citation for the Anne Thomas Prize. So thank you. Um, the Anne Thomas Prize is presented to the specialty registrar based in Wales with the highest score in the annual faculty final membership exam. Anne Thomas was a consultant in public health in Wales with a keen interest in supporting new trainees in public health. On her death in 2004, she left an endowment which was used to establish the Anne Thomas Prize. I'm very pleased to present this award to Christopher Emerson and congratulate him on his outstanding performance in the final membership exam. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Ellis, um, for that lovely citation and many, many congratulations, Chris, on this well-deserved award. Shall we congratulate Chris, please, colleagues? Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. I'd now like to move on to our next award. And this, uh, this award is going to be presented by Dr. David Chappell, our academic registrar, and it will cover both 2020 and 2021. Over to you, David. Thank you. The Faculty's Trainer Award recognises the exceptional work of our educational supervisors and their commitment to public health training. Um, clearly, a critical um, uh, skills to develop the profession in the future. I'm particularly pleased to present the two awards um, for 2020 to Yvonne Young and for um, 2021 to Dudu Sherarami. So Yvonne has made an outstanding contribution to supporting developing the London uh, training program and parts of the Southeast. It's the largest in the country and she's been doing this for well over a decade. In addition to being kind, concerned, readily approachable and accessible to individual registrars, she's demonstrated a long-standing commitment to supporting other educational supervisors, particularly <coughs> in health protection. Yvonne has also made important contributions to the public health curriculum and to uh, national recruitment. <clears throat> Dudu has shown exceptional commitment to training in public health. She treats each trainee as an individual and considers both her educational and well-being needs in a holistic fashion. She encourages creativity, which allows registrars to work at all levels across Enfield with a breadth of partners and stakeholders. She's established Enfield as a placement opportunity for GP registrars and for master's students from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's been described by her trainees as an inspiration, as a supervisor, mentor and friend. So I'm very pleased to uh, give the award these, uh, for both these people. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much uh, Thank David. You. Thank you. And uh, many, many congratulations, Yvonne and, and Dudu. Shall we give them a round of applause? Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if we could move on to our next award. Thank you. And I'm delighted to welcome our colleague, who's the Scottish convener for the Faculty of Public Health, um, our wonderful Julie Kavanagh. Over to you, Julie. Um, thank you. I am so very pleased to be able to um, award the Little John Gaidner Prize. Now, it's a very important award in Scotland. It was introduced by Dorothy Hedewick to commemorate the centenary of the appointment of her father, Sir Henry Duncan Little John, who was a medical officer of health for Edinburgh and his friend, Sir William Tennant Gaidner, as Medical Officer of Health for Glasgow. So this is a historic prize in Scotland, and um, uh, it's great to be able to uh, read the citation. So the award's open to specialty registrars in Scotland who've delivered an outstanding and significant piece of substantive public health work. And 
I'm delighted that the awards to be presented to Kate today, to Kate Mark, for her outstanding work on digital health leadership. Now, Kate's taken a leadership role at the Digital Healthcare Innovation Centre in Scotland as an advocate for public health, and, at the, and she was at the forefront of work with stakeholders in the development of digital services to enable COVID-19 testing and contact tracing at scale using innovative methods. Loving the baby as well, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so Kate's approach demonstrated that digital health has a fundamental role to be played in public health. And I'm glad to say that Kate intends to continue to work with digital health colleagues um, through her career to develop a digitally engaged workforce for the good of public health. Um, so delighted with that. Congratulations, Kate. Thank you. And can we give Kate a round of applause and a double round of applause for baby juggling as well. Very well done, Kate. <laughs> yes, we know what that feels like, Kate. So very, very well done. Many, many congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Next slide, please. And now it's a great, a great pleasure and privilege to welcome uh, Professor Sean Griffiths, who was also a president of the Faculty of Public Health. Uh, people may not realise, Sean, but you were one of the first people to reach out to me and you've been unstinting in your support for me in my journey as president. You're so generous of spirit, but thank you so much for joining us tonight and I'll hand over to you to introduce this award. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. And, and can I just add my thanks to you and the whole team at the faculty for everything that you've done for public health and public health training and specialist standards during the pandemic? Because I, I think that uh, you really need the due recognition for that. Here tonight uh, to talk about the Sean Griffiths Global Public Health Award, uh, which I set up when I demitted as president in 2004, which, as Jim says, we, it does seem a long time ago since we were presidents. But uh, I wanted to establish an award that recognized and celebrated the unique contribution of public health professionals working in global public health. Uh, and I'm delighted to present the award tonight to Megan, who I haven't yet met, Megan Evans who has worked uh, in different environments, um, uh, particularly in the Gambia, where she worked on the barriers uh, to the provision and uptake of infertility services. Uh, but she also worked uh, in India on a collaborative project on uh, prison health and TB uh, and, and uh, was able to set up novel solutions, um, which I believe are continuing in collaborative efforts. So Megan, many congratulations, and uh, I hope that you continue your career in global health. Thank you very well, much. Wonderful. That was a really beautiful citation. And thank you so much, uh, Sean, for being with us tonight. And many, many congratulations, Megan. Let's give Megan a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. And now I have great pleasure in introducing our next award. Well, in actual fact, I'm going to hand over to um, James Gore, our chief executive of the faculty and very important. I think uh, James would agree to recognise the staff of the faculty. Over to you. Thank you, Maggie. I'll just wait to see if all of our award winners appear. Um, should be one more, we have three winners. Great. So yes, I think faculty staff work with our members in a variety of different roles and a number of years ago, we established a faculty award for staff to enable our members to recognise the staff team's hard work and outstanding achievements. Nominations for the award may be for any aspect of our work, but must be supported by two members or fellows. And it's a great pleasure for me to present this year's award to three members of the faculty team. Gareth Cook, our Education and Training Manager, Laura Bland, our Senior Diplomat Exam Coordinator, and Victoria Strode, our Final Membership Exam Coordinator. In response to COVID-19 last year, it was agreed to move the faculty's two exams from a physical to a virtual environment. This presented the exams team, a very small team, with an exceptional challenge and a steep learning curve. But through outstanding teamwork, commitment and hard work, 
The exams were successfully developed and established online with, within months, with the final membership exam held vir first held virtually in September last year and the first diploma exam held online in November. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to recognise the exceptional work undertaken by Gareth, Laura and Victoria. Thank you so much, uh, James. And uh, I know myself how hard all you and the faculty staff work, but it's important to have, have the recognition. As you say, it's been exceptional what's been achieved by um, Gareth, Laura and Victoria. And if you could thank all your staff, uh, James, for everything they do, let's show our appreciation and applaud Gareth, Laura and Victoria. Very well done. And I'd now like to hand over to um, Giri, our registrar, who's going to introduce the next award, please. Thank you very much, Maggie. Um, so I'm going to award the, the Sa Sam Ramaya Award for work on um, health topics that seeks to improve the health of black and minority ethnic communities and to reduce health out, uh, health inequalities in the UK. Um, many people might remember Sam, who was a DPH uh, in Walsall, as well as being an assistant registrar for the faculty. He, he died a few years ago, but his work, particularly in relation to minority ethnic communities, particularly in relation to pulling a whole range of colleagues together to, to develop a movement around that in the early 2000s, have been an inspiration for most of us. And, and much of the work, I think, that followed both nationally uh, and uh, as well as in parts of uh, England followed on from the efforts that Sam Sam made in, in, in those years. And so I'm delighted to present this year's award to Chantelle Fatania for her work in, in Haringey. Uh, people will probably know that Haringey is a pretty diverse set of communities with huge amounts of deprivation. And when we talk about communities and diversity, it probably just about covers every part of the world, I think, all the way from you know, the Americas, the Caribbeans, to Europe, to Asia, Africa, and, and so on. So it is a really complex arena of work. And the work she did in terms of commissioning community projects to provide up-to-date messaging about COVID-19 and, and development of strategic framework for bereavement and loss, I think is, is an excellent piece of work which deserves the prize that I'm about to award her. So I'm very pleased to say, Chantel, um, the faculty recognizes the excellence of your work and congratulations on receiving this award. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to receive this award. Thank you so much, uh, Giri. Excellent citation. And Chantelle, many, many congratulations. And as Giri said, such an important area for the faculty and, and obviously to recognise Sam's legacy. So thank you very, very much indeed. Let's uh, show our appreciation of Chantelle and uh, uh, join me in applauding her. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. And that now brings us to our Synergy Award. And I am absolutely delighted that Professor Lindsay Davis, also a previous president of the faculty, and again, someone who's been um, exceptionally kind and supportive to me, both in my career, where, um, where we worked together in, in previous roles I've had at the faculty when Lindsay was president, but also, again, reached out to me when I was appointed President when I was elected as president. So thank you, Lindsay, for all your support. I'll hand over to you for this award. Well, thank, thank you, Maggie. And um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to present the Synergy Award. Um, I established it when my term as president came to an end in 2013. And um, with the idea of celebrating joint working between the faculty and other organisations um, or individuals, and also to celebrate the <clears throat> work and the achievement and the commitments of the people who've been involved in, in joint work. Um, so today it's a particular pleasure to be able to present the award to Dr. Jenny Lyle and to Dr. Farhang Tarzib. Jenny has been very actively involved in the health and work agenda for many years, working with the Faculty of Public Health and the Faculty of Occupational Medicine to highlight areas of common interest, um, to strengthen our shared knowledge base, and in particular, to develop opportunities for 
register our secondment and training in, in both directions. Um, this has at times been very, very far from straightforward to my certain knowledge, and I'm full of admiration for Jenny's focus and her insight and her determination to get things done, uh, sometimes against what must have seemed like almost insuperable odds. She's still exploring ways of developing the collaboration. So well done and, and thank you, Jenny. Um, Farhang, very different um, area of work. And in his role as chair of the faculty's ethics committee, Farhang has shown really outstanding commitment and leadership. And he's developed very effective and very wide ranging collaborations between the faculty and academics and others working in public health ethics and law. This joint work is now making a real difference, helping to build ethical and legal concepts into the thinking and the day-to-day -day work of public health trainees, practitioners and leaders. And as part of this process, Farhang has sought out and drawn together organisations and disciplines that haven't historically been central to the faculty's work. He's built a great platform for the future as a result. Ethics was on the periphery for far too long. So well done and, and thank you, Farhan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so, so very, very much, uh, Lindsay, for that excellent citation. And could we applaud both um, Jenny and Farhang, colleagues, please, for their outstanding achievements. Very, very well done. And uh, thank you, Lindsay. And if we could now move on, please, colleagues. And the next award, I have the great honour of reading the citation myself. So um, I would like, obviously, Ellis to join me, and uh, he has done, put his camera on. This is the Wilford Harding Prize. It was created in 1990 by Dr. Wilfred Harding, a former president of the faculty, to recognise members who had made a significant contribution to the work of the faculty. And it's my great pleasure to present this award to Ellis Friedman. Ellis has made an exceptional contribution to the work of the faculty over many years. Since 2015, he's been the Faculty of Public Health Treasurer, but had previously served as an examiner, local board member, faculty advisor and assessor. Thanks to his prudent budgeting outstanding stewardship as treasurer, the faculty is now in a really good, stable financial position. As a faculty officer, he's, above, he's gone be above and beyond the call of duty in supporting the faculty. He's also been a very important support to me in my role as president, and I'm very grateful for that, Ellis. And he's also um, been able to influence much of the policy, particularly on climate change and the use of not investing in carbon fuels right across colleges, not just within the faculty. So for all those achievements, I'm absolutely delighted to award you the Wilfred Harding Prize, Ellis. Many, many congratulations. And can we show our appreciation to Ellis? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellis. Really appreciate everything you've done for the faculty and continue to do. Many thanks indeed. And now, colleagues, if I may, I'd like to move on to the next, uh, the next prize. And this is the Alwyn Smith Prize. You can see that we, as you know, we're covering two years of the faculty prize giving tonight. So I'm absolutely delighted that we have Professor Mala Rao and Professor Sir Peter Horby here with us tonight. And I'd just like to read the citation. So... The Alwyn Smith Prize is awarded for outstanding contribution to public health research or practice. And in actual fact, it's probably the faculty's highest award. The prize was established by Professor Alwyn Smith when he demitted uh, office as faculty president in 80, uh, 1986. And I'm honored to have the privilege of awarding this year's prize to two outstanding members of the faculty, Professor Marla Rao and Professor Sir Peter Horby. Marla, we know each other well, but it's important that we give you the recognition you deserve tonight. 
So during a long and distinguished career, Marla has achieved international rec recognition for her work on workforce development, strengthening health systems and environmental health. Her research on policy issues has influenced health strategies, benefiting millions of people in the UK and globally. She has achieved global recognition as a champion for climate action and sustainable development. Marla is a highly esteemed leader in public health and with a lifelong commitment to social justice and race equality. And now I'll carry on, uh, Peter, if I may, and uh, continue with your citation. Peter is a professor of emerging infectious diseases at the University of Oxford and has gained international prominence for his contribution to the clinical treatment of COVID-19 and the success of the recovery trial. As chair of the UK's new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group, otherwise known as NERVTAG, and a member of the SAGE group, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, he has been highly effective and influenced the government's response to COVID-19. In June 2021, he received a knighthood and the Queen's birthday honours for his contribution to medical research. So many congratulations to both of you. And as I said earlier, I know we can't, we really enjoy having everyone speak, but time won't allow that. But we have asked both Marla and Peter to say a few words. So Marla, if I could pass to you, please. Well, um, President of the faculty, Maggie Ray, distinguished colleagues and friends, I am hugely honored and somewhat overwhelmed to be awarded the Alvin Smith Prize today. I have pursued public health with a passion for nearly four decades. However, my love of my chosen specialty was kindled much earlier when as a medical student in India at the time the smallpox eradication program was ending, I was enthralled by what multidisciplinary public health teams could achieve. Nevertheless, my journey from the time when I was a young public health trainee until today has not been an easy one. And this no longer appears surprising given what we now know of the influence of race and ethnicity on our life chances and our careers in this country. In preparing for today, I've been reflecting on my career and the negative attitudes and behaviors that I have endured over the years. And I recognize now that perhaps it isn't these, but it is the denial of opportunity, which is the most serious barrier that I and others like me face in trying to achieve our full potential. That said, I have difficulty in agreeing with those from all ethnicities who claim that the challenges of political ideology, reorganization, change, and much more make effective public health practice hard. I do so because I firmly believe we can make a transformational difference within our spheres of influence however limited or confined that may be, as those denied wider opportunities know only too well. And as some of you will know from my history, capitalizing on any opportunity I had to benefit public health has been my way of responding to the limitations I experienced. From the time in the 1980s when I risked the wrath of a government in denial about the wider determinants of health by insisting on maternal social support to address the high risk of infant mortality in young army families, a fact which I had uncovered, I had drawn comfort by making a demonstrable difference despite the harsh realities of my career track uh, uh, on many occasions. But of course, none of this would have been possible without the support of others. And there are many people I must thank, starting with my husband and family and friends and colleagues who I'll be thanking in private. But there is one much respected friend and ally I'd like to thank publicly, and that is Lord Patel of Bradford, president of the Royal Society for Public Health. It is his launch of my report on race inequality seven years ago, which triggered transformative change in terms of greater awareness of racism and a race equality strategy in the health service, and importantly gave people like me the voice we previously did not have, the permission to share our stories, and the hope that change may be beginning. As I conclude, I draw on evidence which James Gore and Mag Connolly of the faculty kindly shared with me. The records are a little uncertain, so I'll play safe and suggest, as James recommends, that I'm probably the first ethnic minority woman to be awarded this prize. 
I am honored to probably be the first, but borrowing the words of the Vice President of America, I certainly hope I'm not going to be the last. Indeed, given all that you and the faculty are doing, Maggie, I feel absolutely confident that will not be so. And I hope that my award will encourage colleagues of all ethnicities, especially junior colleagues, to go out there and help achieve a healthier and fairer world. I am truly humbled, Maggie, to receive this prize. And I thank you and I thank the faculty. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Marla. It's a very well-deserved award. I've been with you along the way for some of that journey. You've worked incredibly hard and uh, had that resilience that you so desperately need in public health. I wish your journey had been easier at times, but I hope tonight we've fully recognised all your achievements and I'm incredibly proud to have been able to make this award to you. I'd now like to, if I may, hand over to Peter. Great. Um, thank you, Maggie. Um, really, you know, when so many people have done so much in the past uh, two years, I, I feel extremely privileged and honoured and, and rather surprised, actually, <laughs> that, I was, that I was chosen. Um, it could have gone to so many people. Uh, I have a, you know, a deep connection but with, with public health in the UK, but, but a bit intermittent, I must say. Um, but I've always been proud to be part of the UK public health community. I left um, what was PHLS in 2003, the same year that it transitioned to the HPA, um, to go to Vietnam for SARS, as it was known then, and we now have to know it as SARS-1. Um, and in a sort of gruesome symmetry, I, I returned again um, to work closely with UK Public Health for SARS-2 um, in the same year of another transition, um, from PHE to the Health Security Agency. So you know, my, my main hope is that the, the transition is, is transformative and not cosmetic, as we've seen in the past. There have been many changes to public health in the UK, which I've observed and been part of. Um, many of them have, I think, you know, to an extent, disempowered you know, public health. And I think that really must change. And I was thinking about, you know, there'll be a lot of inquiries in the next you know, year or so. And we've seen the first just come out with the, the press picking rather stark headlines, which are unfortunate. Um, and I was thinking about whether you know, there's a time for another review and renewal of public health in the UK. Um, but as soon as I was getting the Orwin Smith Prize, I thought I would go back and look at his report, you know, um, the nation's health. Um, and I was quite astonished actually by how um, insightful it was I looked at you know it, there were eight um, eight markers of, of effective public health action and I just want to quickly list six of them um, which are amazingly pertinent you know strong partnership between public health and policy did we achieve that at the level we wanted in the last two years um, strong national and local structures we saw a lot of centralization did we use enough local uh, knowledge and and was that strong enough? Adequate funding. I don't need to say any more about that. I think we know what the answer to that is. Long term strategic planning. I think we've seen that strategic planning failed um, for pandemic influenza, and I think we should take a hard look at strategic planning for many um, health issues, not just um, infectious diseases. Effective measures to decrease inequalities. I mean, you know, Marla has said a lot about about inequalities, but. Um, I remember tweeting a map of um, <clears throat> deaths from uh, a 1918 influenza pandemic um, mapped to socioeconomic areas. Um, and it was a mirror of what happened in 2020. Um, we have not seen changes um, in the impact of inequalities. Well, the extent of inequalities and the impact on health. Um, and finally, the six I wanted to pick was um, the importance of research, evaluation and monitoring. Um, I think we've seen that good quality research can be transformative and has been transformative um, when linked with public health um, policy, but also commercial um, factors during the pandemic, particularly you know, with the recovery trial, but also with the vaccines. Um, I think we've seen less investment in research and evaluation for public health measures. And that, that is um, something that needs to be rectified, given that you know, the biggest impact in the first year was public health measures. Um, and we did not see the evaluation that we wanted, <clears throat> even though we asked for it repeatedly. And that's not because 
people weren't bothered. It was because people were too busy and there wasn't the investment and there weren't the systems there. So I'm really hoping that this this will be a watershed and that, that things will change and that there will be um, investment uh, in, in public health and recognition of the both the central and essential importance of public health for, for social and, and, and health welfare. So um, and just some reflections. And again, I to say I'm, I'm extremely honoured to receive this award. I'm very grateful and thank you very much, Amelia. Thank you very, very much, uh, Peter. Again, what a lovely message you've, you've given us for tonight. And we're very, very grateful to you. Thank you so much. So um, thank you, Marla and Peter. As we now move to the closing, um, the closing statements for this event, firstly, I would like to record my sincere thanks to all of you who have joined us today to welcome our new distinction and honorary members and celebrate our prize and award members and their outstanding achievements. I do hope you've enjoyed today's event. We very much look forward to working with our new distinction and honorary members over the coming months and years. And we'd be particularly delighted to hear from any of you who have particular interests on which you would like the faculty to engage with the faculty on. Finally, I am very pleased to tell you, I mentioned earlier in today's event that we'd very much like to host a celebrated reception in London when time allowed. And hot off the press, I'm delighted to tell you that we have booked an event for the 7th of April 2022 for all our new members and prize and award winners. So please get that date in your diary. We will be communicating with you the 7th of April 2022. And further details, as I say, will be sent out to you in due course but you may want to get the date in your diary and we'd be delighted to see you there. So you've got the date for next year. That's something else for you to look forward to. We look forward to welcoming you. And it now is just my, um, my pleasure to thank you all for coming, to say how much we appreciate your support as a faculty, to thank all of my, um, my board, my, uh, my officer colleagues, all of the staff at the faculty, and really everyone who helps contribute to make the faculty such a success. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and I wish you a lovely evening. Many thanks indeed. Thank you.